Hello and welcome everyone to this presentation about the alternative protein industry, uh, impact and career opportunities. My name is Pia and uh, I found a Tellist and we match alternative protein businesses with the best talent from around the globe. This is the agenda for this presentation. I want to give you an overview of the industry, particularly the market size and the impact potential. Then I want to share some answers to frequently asked questions by candidates, if you consider maybe a, a career in this field. And I want to share some resources with you that might be helpful to look further into this topic after the talk. I'm also available for your personal questions. I'm not sure if we'll manage in the presentation. So I would just invite all of you to the office hours. Um, they are directly after this talk. And I heard they are in room three, which seems to be across uh, the floor. So everyone is invited to come and meet me there for your personal questions. So before I start with the actual presentation, I like to know who's in the audience today. So um, just to get an impression, who knows already, uh, who is familiar with the alternative protein industry? Please raise your hands. Okay. Who of you uses alternative protein uh, yeah, products, alternatives to animal products? Okay, that's like the majority of the audience. And then um, I had an awakening moment when it comes to all protein. I always had a hard time skipping drinking cow milk, to be honest. And then I came across Barista Oatly and it was a life changer for me. It really enabled me skipping the cow milk and going to plant-based. Who has a similar awakening moment in their past where one particular product really helped you skip something? Ah, okay, few people. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will start now with uh, an overview of the industry. So the alternative protein industry is all about replacing animal products in the food and beverage industry. And the three main technologies that they use is plant-based fermentation or precision fermentation and cellular agriculture. And lately it becomes more and more of a trend to also make hybrid products, which means mixing ingredients based on these different technologies. So it, we talk about, for example, uh, burger patties. We already talked about the plant-based milk, but it's also single components, for example, fat created in the lab, like clean fat, clean meat. Maybe you've heard these buzzwords. And this is uh, the very impressive growth of the industry. So it has been growing very rapidly in the last couple of years. Uh, these are two landscape maps and you can see in the left corner, um, yeah, you can actually see the, the logos of the companies. And then if you look at the landscape map from this year, it's really hard to recognize the single logo because it's so crowded. And I think that's a great visual representation of how much the industry, industry has been growing. And why is it such a special industry? So the theory of change is by offering alternatives to animal products, we can reduce the consumption of animal products, therefore also reducing factory farming and all its horrific side effects. And the great thing is that it tackles so many things, so many problems on a large scale that we also as parts of this community care about. So animal suffering, the pollution of water and air, even global health hazards. So I even didn't know that until recently, but actually most antibiotic resistant germs are bred in the factory farming. It's not human need or, or consumption of antibiotics, but it's animals because they use them in, in huge factories of 10,000s of animals. So it is also global health hazards. And to really show how much impact you can have by working in this industry, we created a so-called impact calculator. So let's have a look at it. For example, if you joined a company replacing fish products in a full-time entry-level position, you could replace 26 tons of fish every year or take the equivalent of 44 vehicles off the road or save 27 football pits of land. So... 
yeah, also showing that it, it really, you know, has a positive impact on, on several levels. So feel free to play around with this tool. It's on our website. And um, yeah, I hope it shows you how, how much impact potential the industry has. <clears throat> Now the FAQs. So we run monthly uh, events for candidates, for people considering working in this field. And usually we always hear a couple of questions in, in every event. So basically I selected these questions for you and I will share the answers to these questions with you. One of the most frequently asked questions is which roles are in high demand? My answer usually is uh, various. So it really depends on a couple of questions. Uh, sorry, a couple of factors. So, for example, the stage of the startup, the technology they use, for example, plant-based or precision fermentation, and even their go-to-market strategy. So, to make it a bit more concrete, let's talk about some examples. Um, early stage startups usually look for R&D staff, people that can help them create a new product. And the more complex the technology, the more specific the roles are. So cellular agriculture is a very complex technology. We can compare it to pharmacy um, when it comes to the R&D cycle. So it takes several years to develop something and it requires highly specialized roles and skills. Um, it's a bit easier to, to develop a plant-based product, for example. Then once a company has their product already on the market, they might want to scale up. So they might want to build their own uh, manufacturing site and then it becomes more relevant to have uh, process engineers, quality management, things like that. They will also want to market their products and uh, there are different ways to, to market all protein products. You can either sell them to, for example, restaurants, you can sell them to supermarkets and see them in the shelves, or you can also distribute them to the end consumers directly. So you might want to have B2B sales representatives or people working in online marketing. And based on that, the skills that are required are also very diverse. So, of course, a lot of scientific expertise and skills are needed. Just to give some buzzwords, biology, chemistry, bioscience. Then, of course, uh, especially for the recipe, like what, what kind of texture we want to create, what kind of tastes. We're looking for food science and nutrition. As I said, for the, the scale-up phase, we need engineers, people who uh, have experience uh, in manufacturing and marketing, sales, business development and strategy skills. Which companies are hiring and what are they looking for in new hires? Well, almost all of them hire sooner rather than later. So typically in an early stage startup, they will want to look for people to build their core management team. So they want to usually have people with um, mid to senior work experience that can really build up a department, a team, and even lead the startup through a certain process. For example, they might want to have a CSO who is able to lead the whole startup team through the process of developing a new product. Then after Series A and B, that's actually a quite exciting time for guys, for people looking for career opportunities, because in this industry, a Series A or B usually means several millions of dollars of investment. And usually companies want to invest that in hiring people, a lot of people. So usually um, you will see multiple new roles open after um, a startup successfully raised their Series A or B. So that's an exciting time to look out for if you want to keep the market inside, basically. And then, of course, we have mature startups. For example, Oatly is, is already a quite mature startup and probably works more like a corporate, which means that they have a very planned way of hiring. They usually have their very own in-house recruiter department. So that's a bit different. That's let, less startup-like. What types of work arrangements are available? Again, it depends a little bit on the role, but also on the company culture. So some roles obviously require strict on-site work. For example, R&D, if you are in a lab creating a new recipe, creating a new product, then you usually need to be on-site. 
other roles could be done remotely. For example, online marketing is a great and obvious example. And then it really depends on the company culture. And then, of course, there are roles like sales that almost require you not to be in the headquarter, but maybe in a completely different region where you want to uh, expand into a new area. So it's really worth uh, looking at the individual job ad. And also, if this is important to you, just ask and negotiate with, with the employers. From our perspective, we usually really yeah, try and, and encourage companies to offer remote and hybrid as much as possible because that's in demand from the uh, employer, sorry, the, the candidate side, but it's also a company culture. So, yeah. This is something, how to read a job ad. We hear this regularly. I think uh, my answer here is not industry specific. So probably you can transfer this to any kind of job ad. And I usually advise a very systematic approach, which means that you really go through every bullet point, especially of the uh, the tasks of the role and the requirements. So you go through every bullet point and then you try to brainstorm where have you done something similar? Where can you show that you have transferable skills or expertise? Maybe even a track record. A track record means that you try to quantify. For example, I have built up a team of 10 skilled volunteers within three months. That's a clear track record. That's a success. And if you can add something like this, it becomes very exciting for employers. Um, there might be things that you have not done yet in the past. That's fine. Maybe you have done something similar. If not, you can just show your willingness to build up skills and new knowledge. So that's that's very positive as well to just highlight. I've noticed that there's a gap, but I would be very willing to take this course or uh, be trained by that person to build up new skills. And last but not least, mission alignment. So uh, some companies think it's a nice to have, other companies think it's a must have, but it's always a very great benefit if you can show that you're really mission aligned. Again, do not just claim it, but make it like more believable. For example, I've been active in this vegan group. I really care about animals. So I think you have a great mission and I want to help you succeed with that mission. And then how to write a motivational letter. Um, well, it seems obvious, but it isn't if you read a lot of motivational letters like we do. Keep it clean, keep it short. Don't just repeat your CV, but add something that you can't express in a CV. And um, yeah, also try to really adapt it to every different job ad. So it's not just copy pasting, but the real value you can bring in is relating to the specifics of a particular job or a company. I actually don't know what the time is, but uh, 10, more 10 more minutes, 15, I think 10, 10, 15. Okay. So, well, let's quickly run through the resources. Um, that's very important for me to share this with you because um, if you think that's interesting, I would love you to, you know, just look further into it. And I think these might be helpful resources for you. So definitely check out uh, our job board on talus.org job board. Then the GFI, the Good Food Institute, they have, uh, they call it the massive open online course. <laughs> I didn't add the link because it's too long. Just Google it. Um, this is really interesting because it's basically for free training material. So uh, I always say if you come from a completely different industry, it's good to, to go through this class by yourself. Um, because then at least you know more than before uh, concerning the alternative protein industry, but also particular technologies that are used in this industry. Then there is the protein directory. They, for example, have a, a company database, which is even more comprehensive than the one from the GFI. I can also recommend two podcasts in particular. One is called Cultivating Careers in Alternative Proteins. And uh, they basically introduce someone working in a specific career in this field with every episode. So that's super interesting. You can go through their list. They just had their 20th episode out and see if there is someone with a career that you find interesting and then listen to, to their podcast episode and maybe get new inspiration. Then some newsletters and magazines. Of course, GFI has a huge newsletter. 
Then there is food hack. That's not all protein specific, but general more like the future of food, um, the future of protein production and the economist. And then two communities I also want to highlight here is the GFI all protein student group. So these are basically university groups of people interested in that field. You could either see if there's uh, one that you can join or even consider founding your own student group. And then there are more and more SELEC nonprofits. Uh, so for example, I also co-founded SELEC Germany uh, in 2021. And I think the latest one was SELEC Spain, which was founded this year. So maybe see if there's any SELEC nonprofit in your country or region. Um, yeah, and then we actually do have time for some Q&As. So thanks for listening, first of all. And now feel free to, to ask anything that is interesting to you for, I guess, five to 10 more minutes. Don't be shy, give it a try. Okay, then I'm gonna ask you something out of curiosity. Who of you is strictly vegan? Please raise your hand. Okay, those who didn't raise their hand, um, I'm going to name two or three uh, products now and you tell me what is the reason you're not vegan? Is it meat? If it's meat, please raise your hand. Okay, two people. Is it fish? Please raise your hand. Uh-huh, one, one, two people. Two and a half. <laughs> uh, is it cheese? Yeah. Confirmation bias, but... <laughs> I, I was assuming so, and, and yeah, so that, that actually is one of the challenges we still have to face in the all protein industry, if you ask me, to bring really competitive cheese on the market. And uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe one of you think that is uh, challenging enough to give it a try. Devin. Do you know why it's hard to make cheese uh, compared to the other products? Why is it so difficult to make that really tasty cheese? Yeah, I think on the one hand, it's a, it's a very practical uh, reason because um, vegetarianism has been around much, for much longer. So the motivation to replace meat has been around for much longer. So there's just, I think, um, 10 to 20 years of gap developing uh, basically vegan alternatives to cheese compared to meat. But then also... Um, Cow milk proteins are really, like cow milk is super complex. Actually, every kind of mammal milk <laughs> is really complex, so uh, it's hard to, to replace it. Um, there's one startup in Berlin that I'm super excited about. They're called Formo, and they use precision fermentation to literally create the same protein that you can also find in cow milk. But... Um, yeah, it's it's very difficult to just simulate the exact same, uh, exact same taste and texture and functionality of, of milk, of cow milk. Yeah. Can you ask the previous question in a way that who is not vegan because it's very difficult to have access to these kind of foods or it makes your everyday life very difficult? Uh, pardon, like asking, you yeah. Asking people like, why are you not vegan? You are not vegan because you want to eat meat or there is no good stuff. Yeah. But can you ask again the same question that saying, okay, like, is this an access to <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'd love to. That's a great idea, actually. So of those who, who aren't vegan, um, who would say it's because you don't have access to great alternatives? Okay. Yeah. Good, thank you. That was a great idea. Yeah. Alternatives. Uh, like in my own kind of a research, I'm still not fully convinced about the, the protein side of uh, veganism, let's, let's say so. Is there, out of the resources that you mentioned, is there anything that I can read uh, on basically like how, how to substitute meat efficiently so I get enough micronutrients and enough protein because I think um, animal, like the way animal protein is, let's say, digested and the plant-based protein is digested are different. Is there anything that you could re recommend me as individual and maybe also as a group to read about to figure this out? 
yourself? I would assume uh, that the organization ProVeg is pretty strong with this because they promote more the vegan diet. So I think you might find more uh, um, research and recommendations on the ProVeg website. I'm not sure actually if GFI also covers this particular aspect, but I'm quite sure ProVeg does. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Well, if you don't have any other questions in here, as I said, feel free to come to the office hours. Maybe you have something personal you would like to discuss and I'm very happy to, to help. Otherwise, thank you so much for your interest in this topic. I'm very happy to see that, yeah, you are interested in this field. I can strongly recommend it. I really like working in this industry. It almost feels like more like yeah, working in a, a community of friends because people really are mission aligned. So it's, it's, it's nice and it's exciting. It's innovative and you feel like you're really contributing to something good in the world. So hope to see some of you around. Thank you.